plenty of people I work with who disagree with me, who say we don't need this technology, we've lived uh, long enough without this technology, um, and I think, well, it's just another kind of technology and can be used for good or can be used for evil. And good purposes, it can be used over vast expanses of land where it's hard to uh, have a, uh, it's hard to monitor, for example, to find out and pinpoint where a forest fire is happening. Or in the Amazon where the Brazilian government is using it to try to stop the illegal lobby. And there are environmental groups that are already using drones uh, in the high seas when they're trying to stop the whalers. Uh, or to track endangered species. There are many potential commercial uses for drones. And um, there are many hobbyists who like the technology, just like they like the model airplanes. Uh, and they would like to use the drones just for fun. Um, so there are many potential uses for drones. And some of them, I would say, are good. I want to focus on the lethal drones, the killer drones. And those are produced by a company mainly in Southern California called General Atomics. But the parts for these drones are made all over the country, which is what the industry does. It wants to distribute these jobs all over the place so that our Congress people will then say, oh, we need to keep producing these things because jobs, jobs, jobs. Um, the, in, the, these drones carry Hellfire missiles, which have a huge impact when they land, uh, and they are being piloted. <laughs> the surreal thing about this technology is that the pilots are here in this country. So they're sitting in an air-conditioned room, and there was a study done that said, oh, their chairs are kind of uncomfortable. We need to make them more ergonomic. Uh, these guys are sitting for 10 or 12 hours a day in front of a screen that's like a PlayStation. In fact, it's been modeled after a PlayStation. And it's like a video game. And they are pressing buttons that are killing people thousands of miles away. They don't have to be near the battlefield. They don't have to have been to the country. They don't have to speak the language, know the culture, or anything. It's a very strange way of conducting war that the risk is not being taken on our side. Uh, but we are risking the lives of many people because we're not very sure about who we are killing on the other side. Uh, this this um, is a, a New Yorker cartoon, but it just shows, you know, oh, are you attacking from home today, honey? Uh, so you can really be doing this from anywhere. Um, one of the main complaints of the pilots has been boredom because they're sitting at the screen for hour and hour after hour after hour. And um, the, this affects pilots in different ways. I dedicate a chapter of the book to looking at the pilots because it's important to get a sense of how, who are these people, and many of these are young kids that grew up playing video games, and how are they affected by this. Some of them think, this is cool, I can do my job and then go home to my family at night. Some of them think, this is boring, I'd rather be in the battlefield where the action is. And some of them say, this is really uh, creating tremendous psychological problems for me because uh, they are not just coming in and dropping a bomb and leaving, they are watching the neighborhood and even the homes for days, sometimes weeks at a time, and getting to know the family in a very strange way. So they see the father playing with the kids, and they see the mother washing clothes, and they see the kids going off to school, and then one day they're told to press the kill button. They also see what happens sometimes, like uh, a uh, drone pilot has described when he was very careful to make sure that nobody was around when there was a, a what they considered a dangerous militant and he was in his car by itself and he presses the kill button and suddenly he sees coming into his sight two boys on a bicycle and there's nothing he can do about that and he said uh, and he said this will stay with me the rest of my life and the studies that have been done show that there is a significant level of PTSD among the drone pilots, similar to soldiers who are in the battlefield. So who does the killing? Who decides who's going to uh, get killed? Well, it's really quite <coughs> amazing to think that we have a constitutional lawyer in the White House, to say nothing to a Nobel Prize winner, who every Tuesday on what has been nicknamed Terror Tuesdays, 
invites his advisors into the White House, and they start looking through nominees to be on the kill list. And they say it's like baseball cards where they have a little bio and a picture, and they discuss, well, is this guy bad enough? Maybe not. Uh, I don't know. Somebody else makes an argument. Yeah, he's really bad. Let's put him on the kill list. And uh, so this is an example of when the pilot, the remote control pilot, is actually looking for an individual. So, excuse me, sir, but you know, say you are put on the kill list. That's one way of killing people. The other is a much more expansive way, and that is called a signature strike. And that is when the uh, <coughs> pilots are able to kill people based on suspicious activities. So it looks like you were in a training camp, it looks like you have explosives, it looks like you are part of a militant group. But what we have discovered, and the administration has not refuted this, is that they describe every male of military age that's in the zones where we are using these drones is a militant. Just like that. So they don't have to justify attacking a group of people, except on the grounds that it looks like suspicious behavior. So, it turns out that we can only identify 2% of the people who have been killed in the drone strikes as having been on this high uh, target list. And the rest of them, innocent people, low-level Taliban, uh, we really don't know because our government doesn't tell us. The um, places where we are using these drones, use them in Iraq. We continue to use them in Afghanistan, and I want to show you a chart here that is very disconcerting. If you look at the increase in the number of missiles fired in Afghanistan, you'll see a tremendous increase from 2011 to 2012. So as the war is supposed to be winding down in Afghanistan, the troops are supposed to leave from there, we see more of a reliance on the drones. And uh, we have no guarantees that when the troops leave, one, we don't know how many will be left behind, but we don't know how many drones might be left behind. This is part of negotiations that we are not privy to with the Afghan government. Um, going back to look at some of the other places where the drones are being used, uh, they're being, they were used in, in Libya, uh, which was a very important case to look at because in the case of Libya, the administration wanted to go in and give air support, but instead of going to Congress to get the okay, just made the decision uh, unilaterally. And when people of Congress complained and said, wait, we're the ones that are supposed to decide about whether we get involved in a violent conflict, the administration said, no, you don't understand, we're just using drones. And when we're using drones, there are no U.S. lives that are at risk, and so this isn't a war. So we don't have to ask Congress about this. It shows a tremendous power grab by the executive branch of government. The other places that drones have been used, Pakistan, Yemen, Somalia, the Philippines, drone bases all over the Middle East. One that concerns me particularly, you might see, they say I have a little pointer here is the one in Saudi Arabia, because uh, Osama bin Laden said that one of the reasons he hated the United States was because we had bases in the Holy Lands in Saudi Arabia. Do you remember that? <laughs> so what did George Bush do? Well, yeah, he went ahead and attacked a, a, a country, Iraq, that had nothing to do with 9-11, but he did close down the bases in Saudi Arabia, knowing how antagonistic that was uh, to the Muslim world. And now we have, under President Obama, the opening of a new drone base in Saudi Arabia that I think is a tremendous threat to our national security. There are also drone bases that are being set up in parts of Africa, also around the Pacific, off of the islands, uh, uh, in, in, off of Australia, and who knows where else, because we really don't know uh, the extent of this drone program. Remember, it's a covert program. So, um, the, uh, uh, Pakistan is the place where the drones have been used the most outside of Iraq and Afghanistan. And in Pakistan, 
the um, drone strikes have been mainly under the Obama administration. What the Bush administration was known for was capturing people and sending them to Guantanamo. Right, sending them to Guantanamo or putting them in other prisons, but capturing them. And the uh, Obama administration realized that that was problematic because one, Obama campaigned that he was going to close down Guantanamo. Two, what do you do if you, uh, it would look bad for him to start putting people into Guantanamo. What do you do when they're in Guantanamo if you're not going to give them a trial? Uh, how long are you going to keep them there? That doesn't look good either. And so they really did make a decision that instead of capturing people, they would simply kill them. That's why the number of drone strikes has increased so dramatically under the Obama administration. The program in uh, Pakistan is not run by the military, it's run by the CIA. The CIA is a civilian organization. The CIA should, should not have the power to go around killing thousands of people. And there are people inside the military who are very upset by this and, and feel like the CIA is out of control. Um, we have no idea really how many people have been killed, but we know that there are plenty of innocent people who have been killed, including children. And these are pictures that you don't see on, uh, in your mainstream news. Uh, in fact, most of the people killed by drones uh, are vaporized, so there's not even uh, pa parts of their bodies left. So these pictures that I'm showing are people who have been killed mostly by the shrapnel being too close to the drone strikes. Um, one uh, statistic that I found really disconcerting was that 83% of Americans thought that it was okay a year ago to use drones to kill terrorist suspects. Remember suspect means somebody who's never been tried or convicted of anything. And I just wondered if they had a chance to see some of the pictures of people who've been killed by the drones, um, might they have a different opinion. Um, this is a man we met with in, in Pakistan whose son and brother had been killed by a drone strike. Uh, this is a picture of his compound, his, his home, that had been totally destroyed. And this is a picture of his son and his uh, brother. The two of them were teachers in the local school. And they had purposely gone back to the small village because the Taliban were active in that area. And they wanted to uh, educate the people and tell them that they shouldn't join the Taliban, that it was much more important to get an education than to pick up a gun. <coughs> and uh, this man, Kareem Khan, said to us, imagine the lesson that was learned by the hundreds of students when their beloved teachers were then killed by a drone strike. This is... Um, Another group of men that we met with in Pakistan, whose loved ones had been killed during a community gathering in the tribal areas in northern Pakistan. The tradition is that when there's a dispute in the community, they come together and the uh, elders and the most respected leaders of the community come together to try to resolve the dispute. This dispute was about a local mine. And uh, they were gathered together, and it looked to people in the United States who were piloting these planes remotely, like this was a group of no good Taliban. And so they sent in the drones, and they killed 42 members of this community. 42 members of the most respected members of the community. So imagine the kind of hatred that spread throughout that area after those drone strikes happened. Um, and I want to give you uh, one more example, which is this young man. His name is Harry Gaziz, uh, a young man who hated the drones because they were buzzing over his community all the time, and they killed his younger cousin. And he was invited to the capital Islamabad by some lawyers who said, we're going to do something about this. We're going to file some lawsuits, and we're going to train some of the younger members of the community to get their own video cameras and document drone strikes. And he was very excited about his new role as a citizen journalist. And uh, uh, two days after he returned home from this meeting, uh, this was all that was left of Tarek Aziz. Uh, he and his cousin were killed in a drone strike. 
And the lawyers who had been with them in Islamabad were outraged and went to the U.S. Embassy and said, why did you kill this young man? And of course the answer was, he was a militant. And they said, well, even if you had some proof he was a militant, he was staying in the capital city. He was in a public place. You could have sent somebody in and arrested him and given him a chance to a trial. And of course there was no answer for that, but the answer is they didn't have to because they're not held accountable for any of these deaths. And there was a study done by two very prestigious universities, NYU and Stanford University, that showed something very important that I incorporated into the new edition of my book that's back there, uh, because it's, it's showed that it's not just the numbers of people who have been killed, it's the fact that these drones terrorize entire communities, because people hear the buzzing overhead of the drones constantly, and they say it's like having a bee inside your head that you can't get out. And you think that that drone is going to attack you. That that missile being fired is meant for you. And you never know when it's going to happen. And you think, maybe it'll attack me when I'm sleeping at home. Maybe it'll attack me when I'm in a marketplace because they want to get the guy next to me and I'll be in the wrong place at the wrong time. I'm afraid to go to a wedding or a funeral because those have been attacked. Afraid to go to community meetings because those have been attacked. And afraid to rescue other people who have been hurt in a drone attack because the U.S. has been known to send in a second round of missiles called a double tap to get anybody that wasn't killed in the first attack. And so there's a humanitarian group in that area that has told its people you cannot go in to try to rescue anyone for six hours until after the drone attack because we don't want you, the rescue workers, to get killed. Now, the killing of rescue workers is a war crime. There's no doubt about that. And the U.S. has been involved in the killing through the double taps of rescue workers. So these are some of the things that came out in that study that was done by NYU and Stanford called the <coughs> Drones. The response of the Pakistani people has been outrage. They have, on the grassroots level, been organizing protests. They have been passing legislation through their assembly. And at the national level, while well, initially in the last government, there was some collusion with the United States over this. In this government, they clearly say, we do not want you to do these drone strikes because they are killing a lot of innocent people and they are inflaming the sentiments. They are the best recruiting tool for Al-Qaeda and for the Taliban. They are counterproductive. They are turning people against the Pakistani military, the Pakistani police that has led to deaths of thousands of Pakistanis. And they are creating this anti-American sentiment. So much so that was, there was a poll done that showed that three out of four Pakistanis thought of the United States as their enemy. And when the foreign minister from Pakistan came to the United States and she was asked, why do so many Americans hate us? She had one word answer and that was, no. Exactly. So an extremely counterproductive policy transferred from one country to another one. And that next one is Yemen. There had been some a drone strike early on during the Obama, the Bush administration in 2002, but the drone strikes really started in Yemen in 2009 with Obama, and they have been increased tremendously in the last two years. Now, the uh, group called Al Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula had about 200 members in 2009. And today, after all of these drone strikes, it is estimated that there are over a thousand people that are part of these extremist organizations. So once again, you have an example of that. Now, just last week, there was uh, one of the very rare occasions that Congress has even talked about this, this program. And that was a congressional hearing in the Senate where they had a number of witnesses and for the first time ever in the U.S. Congress, there was a witness from one of the countries that, uh, where we have been using the drones, and that was in Yemen. So this was an extraordinary 22-year-old uh, um, man, here he is, and he was testifying in Congress. 
Now, I wasn't there, but my Copenhagen colleagues who were there said it was incredible that they were sobbing as they listened to this young man. Because, first of all, he's from a very small village, a very poor family, and he got an opportunity, thanks to the U.S. government, to come and study in the United States and do a year abroad, uh, a year as a high school student. And he said he came to love the United States. And he was like the perfect ambassador back in Yemen for the United States. And he talked and talked about his love for this country while he was testifying. And then he talked about the drone attacks. And he said that, um, he talked about a, um, a, a strike that killed 40 civilians. He talked about a 12-year-old boy who cried every time he described how the, buzz, the buzzing of the drones would not let him sleep at night. He talked to a man who held his 4-year-old son and 6-year-old daughter in his arms who died on the way up to the hospital after a drone strike. And he also talked about a drone strike in his own village. He said a village so tiny it doesn't even register on Google Maps. And he never in his wildest dreams believed that his village could be the site of an American drone strike. He said, my village first experienced America through the terror of a drone strike. What radicals had previously failed to achieve in my village, one drone strike accomplished in an instant there is now intense anger and hatred of America. He says, the killing of innocent civilians by U.S. missiles is helping destabilize my country and create an environment favorable to Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula. Drones are the face of America to many Yemenis. If America is providing economic, social, humanitarian assistance to Yemen, the vast majority of Yemenis know nothing about it. Everyone knows, however, about America and its drones. He said, one little boy whose father was killed in the drone strikes carries a picture of a drone in his pocket and says he wants revenge against his father's killer, and his father's killer is America. He said, in some places, hatred of the drone strikes is so strong that this man, young man feels it's dangerous to even acknowledge having visited the United States, never mind having American friends and acquaintances. So, this is a um, pretty heavy testimony that was heard by a small number of people in Congress, but important that finally uh, there was somebody from the region who got a chance to speak. Uh, this is another young boy. This is a 16-year-old, but in the case, this is an American. Uh, and this is an American boy who is the son of the radical cleric Anwar al who you might have heard of. Anwar al is an American who was put on a hit list by President Obama. Uh, he, uh, we never have seen the evidence that Anwar al was involved in uh, terrorist activities. Uh, uh, we know that he preached uh, against the West and actually um, applauded people who killed Americans. Uh, certainly not a very nice guy, but we don't know exactly what he was involved in because it hasn't been disclosed to us. So he was killed, the father, by a drone strike, together with an, another American who is not on the kill list, but happened to be with Anwar al at the same time. But this is the particularly tragic one because this is a young man 16-year-old, the faces that you're seeing here are on his Facebook page that talks about how he loves rap and hip-hop and swimming, and his friends said he was a typical American kid, was not involved in any kind of terrorist activities. Um, he was killed two weeks after his father in a drone strike in Yemen, along with a bunch of other Yemeni teenagers. Now, there has not, unfortunately, been a big outcry in the United States about this. But those who asked, we heard rumors. First, the, there were people in the U.S. who said, uh, government, who said, well, he was militant. He was a 21-year-old militant. His grandfather produced the, the birth certificate showing that, indeed, he was 16-year-old. Uh, then they said, no, we weren't after him. We were after an Egyptian terrorist who was there. Um, but this Egyptian terrorist wasn't there, nor was he killed in the stone strike. 
Um, so we don't know, was it a mistake? We have no idea. But imagine that there has been a 16-year-old American boy killed by the Obama administration without any real acknowledgement that he was even killed, and certainly no kind of apology uh, to his family. So a question that I think we have to ask about our drone program of going around the world killing people on the basis of secret information is, would we allow any other country to do this on our soil? And the answer is absolutely not. On the other hand, we are selling these drones all over the world, so it is bound to happen. The U.S. is selling drones, the U.S. companies are selling drones, the biggest exporter of drones is Israel. And China sees a huge opportunity in a multi-billion dollar business and says, you know, we're going to get involved in this and is now producing dozens of their own kind of drones. So on the map you see the darker red is those who have armed drones, a small number at this point, but the yellow are those who have some kind of drones, surveillance drones. The predator and reaper killer drones we have were surveillance drones originally. So countries right now are in the process of weaponizing their drones. And you can imagine a scenario where the Chinese say we have uh, Tibetan terrorists who are living in the United States. Should we be able to drop a drone in the United States on those people? Mm -hmm. We know from Boston bombings that there are Chechens. Uh, and if the Russians want to kill Chechen militants, uh, can they drop a bomb here in the United States or in London or, or anywhere else? Um, we are setting a model that is a very dangerous one and leads us to a world of chaos and lawlessness. And we don't only have to fear other countries or other non-state entities getting drones, but we also have to feel, fear drones in our own community uh, by our own government. And that's something else that I wanted to mention, which is there are hundreds of permits that have been given out for experimental use of drones in the United States. The reason there are thousands and thousands is because the Federal Aviation Administration controls the airspace, and they know that these drones are very unsafe and uh, that they crash all the time and they don't have the kind of visibility that a pilot has. And so they've been reluctant to open up the airspace. But the drone industry has forced a change in the policy and said that by September 2015, our airspace has to be totally opened up to drones. And they are estimating there will be 20 or 30,000 of these drones in the U.S. airspace by that time. And one of the things they really want to do is sell, sell the drones to police departments. And so Homeland Security has been giving grants to police departments for the experimental use of drones. Um, this one is pretty funny because they, uh, this is in uh, Texas, and they held a press conference. They wanted to show off their new drone, and they got it up into the air, but it immediately crashed into the tank. So um, it wasn't uh, a very good example of all they could do with the drones. But um, after the Boston bombing, uh, the Boston police said they need to get drones, and that if they had, had drones, they would have been able to do better crowd control. Uh, and other police departments are now saying, aha, we really do need drones. And so this has been a tremendous boost to the industry that has also come out after the Boston bombings and said, imagine how we could have uh, done a better job if there had been drones in the air. So um, there are... Uh, I would say the positive thing about this is there are people who are trying to do something about it. And raise your hand here if you've been involved in any kind of activity against drones. Well, definitely not enough people, so we need to change that. Because as Ken said, your state is very involved in drones, whether you like it or not. And there has to be a lot more action here. And one of the things that, that people are doing around the country is passing no drone resolutions in their local community to say, until we know that our safety and our privacy will be respected, we don't want these drones being used by our police departments. Uh, there are states that are passing resolutions calling for a moratorium on the use of drones 
or saying the drones couldn't be used unless there was a warrant, a court order to use them. So there's a lot of activity and I think it would be great on the local level here to try to introduce something into your city council. Because when you do these things locally, they reverberate around the state and they reverberate around the country. And it's important to us to show that these drones being used overseas and the drones being used at home, they're part of the manufacturers who really just want to keep selling uh, these, uh, uh, these planes that we do not need to use, whether it's to kill or to surveil us here at home. <coughs> so I want to end up talking about a trip that we made to Pakistan, because this is the kind of activity that I think shows to our government the kind of modeling of what we would like to see them do. <coughs> I started out my talk uh, looking at the RAND Corporation and the study that it did saying that only 7% of uh, terrorist groups came to their demise through military activity. Well, after 11 years, we are still using this. And so we decided to put out a call to people as Code Pink, my group, to say, let's take a group to Pakistan and be the citizen diplomats that our government refuses to be. And we got 34 people who wanted to go. It was a very scary trip to make because Pakistan is a very violent country. I mentioned to you that three out of four Pakistanis think America is their enemy. And so when we got to Pakistan, we were sitting around the table in our first meeting. I said, which one of you had a loved one who said, do not go on that trip? And everybody raised their hand. And everybody defied that kind of talk and decided that it was so important for them to go anyway. And so we took this trip. Um, we went out onto the streets and we did protests against the drones together with the Pakistani people. The first time the Pakistanis had ever seen anything like that. It was covered in the front pages of the newspapers and on the television every single day that we were there. We had, um, uh, we did a, a fast uh, in front, uh, in a very prominent place in the capital where people could come and talk to us all day long, which they did. They were fascinated to see this group of Americans who cared about their lives. And uh, we went and met with a lot of women's groups and uh, we're in meetings with hundreds of women where we stood up and we held hands and we said uh, to each other in our languages, uh, we will not raise our children to kill other mother's child. And uh, then we went up and did a very scary trip and that was a trip to the tribal areas. Now that was the trip where the ambassador came and said, do not go up to the tribal areas. They hate Americans there, the Taliban is very active there, and we have credible information that they will be trying to kill you. And so we sat in our group and we talked about it and we said we want to go anyway. The morning we were supposed to leave, the embassy sent people over again to say once again, we have credible information, they are going to try to kill you. And I was amazed. I mean, I was really scared because I felt responsible for this group of Americans. And I was amazed that they were still determined to go. And they said the predominant sentiment was, um, we have the luxury of deciding whether or not we want to put our lives at risk. But the people up there do not have their luxury. Their lives are at risk all the time, every day. And so we went in this caravan and uh, we were about 10 hours in the bus and we got up to the area and we had a chance to have uh, a meeting with a huge number of people, all of the men, the women were uh, in this traditional culture not allowed to come out to that. And uh, there we marched up a group of Americans, including mostly women, onto the stage. You know, my heart's going thump, 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 uh-oh, what's going to happen here? And we got a chance to address the crowd, and as we're walking onto the stage, we hear this shouting coming from the crowd, and they're yelling, welcome, welcome, we want peace, we want peace. And it was such a beautiful moment, and all of us started crying, and we started then getting a chance to talk to them. And what we said to them was, we are appalled by our government's policies. We know that a lot of your family members have been killed by these drones. 
And we want to tell you that we believe that your lives are as precious as our lives, and we believe that your children are absolutely as precious as our children, and that there are Americans like us who are opposed to this policy, and that we will do everything within our power to go home and try to change this policy. And they were cheering and roaring after everything we said, uh, and the sentiment, I mean, the, the, the sense of um, community was extraordinary. And this one Pashtun man who, you know, had the turban and the beard, and I'm sure, according to the remote control pilots, looked just like a, a, a militant, uh, put his hand on his heart and said, if you have come here to win our hearts and minds, you have done that. And another one came up and said, I've seen your pictures in the paper and I've seen you on TV every day. And let me tell you, have, you have done more for the positive image of Americans in this one week than all the billions of dollars that your country has been sending year after year to Pakistan. So the little bit of effort that we put out has tremendous results. The kind of citizen to citizen diplomacy uh, is what people are hungry for to see in the rest of the world, especially in the Muslim world. They want us to be coming out there and saying, we do not hate Muslims. We do not want a war on the Muslim world. And so I think it was so reinforced to us that when the only face that they see of the American is reapers and predators and hellfire missiles, and vaporizing people with this high-tech kind of weaponry, the only thing we will get in return is hate and blowback. But if we force the Obama administration and our spineless creatures in Congress <laughs> to do something else, which is to end the war on terror and to say that we want to live in peace with people around the world and that we will show compassion to people around the world. We will show kindness, kindness. We will show them that we do care about their lives and their lives are as valuable as our lives. I think we will find that people will not be trying to attack us here at home. So my message as I go around is let's stop the use of these killer drones. Let's force our government to have that kind of citizen-to-citizen -citizen diplomacy that we showed when our little group went to Pakistan, and the kind of sentiment that I think we have in this room, that we want to live in peace with our brothers and sisters around the world, and that it's about time that our president stop listening to a military-industrial complex that only wants to keep perpetual war so they can make more profits and start doing what is better for our national security at home and start doing better for what is good for peace in the world. So let's get out there and build the kind of peace we want to see. Power to the peaceful. Thank you. Also believe that Yemeni lives are important. 
So that will be in June that we're going, and then if that works out well, um, we hope to take a larger trip in September. Thank you. <coughs> I'm confused about the policy of these Middle Eastern governments like Yemen and Pakistan and so on. Are they actually colluding with the United States, or are they also just powerless victims in this war on terror? A little bit of both. I, I, I never quite understand how the U.S. has so much uh, access in these countries uh, without some cooperation with the, their national governments. Well, thanks to a young man who is languishing now a thousand days in jail, Bradley Manning, and uh, thanks to another man who is holed up in the uh, Ecuadorian embassy in London, Julian Assange, uh, we know from the WikiLeaks cables that there was initially collusion between the U.S. and the Pakistani government, as well as the U.S. and the Yemeni government. Uh, and that collusion comes because these governments get millions and millions, hundreds of millions of dollars from the U.S. for their militaries. So there was a military government under General Musharraf, and he made a deal with the United States and said, okay, you can use these drones, but our people are not going to like it if they know that they're American drones. So we're going to say that they were uh, Pakistani aircraft that dropped these bombs. So that was a past government. Musharraf now says he's no longer in power. He says, yes, I made that deal, but it was supposed to be only for a couple of drone strikes, and I was supposed to be consulted, and I wasn't, and that kind of thing. He's gone. He's out. There's a Democratic government in there now, elected by the people, and that Democratic government says, we do not want you to use these. Now, when we met with them, we said, well, can't you do more to just demand that the U.S. stop? They said, the only thing more that we can do is to shoot down a drone. And we can't afford to do that. It would be war. I mean, the U.S. would consider war against us. And we have the problems with India. We have problems. Uh, Kashmir, we need the U.S. Uh, not, well, we can't afford to do that. So they feel that they have no leverage. Uh, then the case in Yemen. The case in Yemen is the government now agrees to the U.S. using these drones. But there are many people in Yemen who are saying this is causing people to hate the new government and making him be seen as a puppet of the U.S. government. And there is basically a civil war in Yemen we have become part of. So I don't know, does that answer your questions? Collusion in the beginning, Pakistan no more. Thanks. Uh, in the beginning, uh, you showed us some, uh, some of the drones. Um, there was the um, hummingbird and the mosquito or the dragonfly. And uh, then, uh, like a model airplane. Uh, five years ago in the New Mexican, um, there was a small piece in the paper. And it was sort of a rah rah, look at our boys, we're so good. For the Lionel folks up on the hill, and I'm sure there are a number of people in town who are familiar with some people who work up there. Of course, they don't know what they're doing, uh, but they can be confronted. Um, what it, uh, the article stated was, these are nanotechnology drones, mosquitoes. And I thought, oh, yeah, that would be a perfect delivery system for a virus. You could have a plague. Uh, yeah. Uh, so that uh, Madea Benjamin would be so sick she couldn't get out of the pond. Or that we would be so sick we couldn't even be here. So. Uh, yesterday morning, I heard on BBC that the United States has this terrible infiltration of, and this is BBC talk, infiltration of stink bugs. So the plan is to send out killer wasps, and I'm thinking, these are all drones. All the locusts that hit Cairo like a couple of weeks ago, I said, how many drones are in those, uh, those locusts? <laughs> Okay, so my idea is, can we get this more, more, into, uh, more into a local action rather than an exotic, oh, it's the military uh, doing something with 
uh, blowing things up. Whereas, you know, what's really coming down there is, is chem chemical war and viral war. Well, you the vast amount of money that's going into the development of all kinds of drones is coming from the military. And that's the, oftentimes the state universities around this country, uh, the engineering departments say that the only way they can get a decent sized grant to uh, work on issues that uh, their students can get involved in is getting money from the military. So uh, it's important for us to talk to students. I've been going to universities that have been getting a lot of money from the military <coughs> and to try to expose this and expose and say that these young people want to work on things that are for the betterment of humankind. And uh, Lord knows that there are so many issues, particularly around global climate chaos, that we need the best engineering minds of our uh, community to work on. And so I'm feeling excited when I go to places like Johns Hopkins and other universities where there are student groups that have uh, formed and are working and talking to people in the engineering department and trying to transform the way that their departments get money. So that's one of the things that we can do. Um, there's, there's a lot of things that we can do locally. And uh, I do think rather than scaring you all with all the terrible ways that this technology can be used, and I think there are all kinds of ways, and you've uh, alluded to some of them, uh, it's more important that we talk about how are we going to transform ourselves from an economy that's so dependent on uh, money from the military to one that, is, that can free ourselves up to do the research and uh, production of things that are useful for the future we want. I think one way to do that is to really understand how much these military industrial actions are racism and that we resist that and be educated about it on every level that we can because this would not be happening in other white countries. That's such an important point to make and um, I, I have a, a chapter in the book that looks at the ethical and moral issues around this and I was really surprised when I was doing the research about how few people in the faith-based community were speaking out about this. And uh, I went to some of the leaders in the community, like Jesse Jackson, uh, Jim Wallace from Sojourners, and asked them to speak out about it. And they said, oh yeah, 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 that's terrible. But they're not speaking out about it. And um, I asked some of the leaders in the civil rights community to speak out about this, because it is a profoundly racist policy. And can't get them to speak out about it. And you know why? Why? They're terrible. Because it's Obama's policy. Because it's a policy of a Democrat. It's a policy of the first black president. And it is so astonishing to think about how this would all be playing itself out if it was under George Bush. I mean, you would see Jim Lewis out there getting arrested with us saying no to these drones. You would see <laughs> Jesse Jackson on the front lines with us. Um, you would see Barbara Lee, you would see all the progressive Democrats, the Black Caucus, they would be out there with us. And now we can barely get them to say anything about this. There was a, a piece of, uh, it's not even a legislation, it's a, it's a letter sent to Obama that said, basically, we would like you to abide by international law, please. That's all you know, about these drones. There were eight members of Congress that signed on to that. Eight members of Congress. So uh, it is pretty pathetic. And it's pathetic when you see somebody like Senator Rand Paul, a favorite of the Tea Party, who takes it up as his banner and talks in the filibuster for 13 hours about it, when he probably does not give a damn about people of color, poor people in a place like Pakistan or Yemen or Somalia. So things are very topsy-turvy and it just shows how politicized 
Washington is, that whole scene is, and it also reinforces how important it is that this movement come up from the base up. And the movement is happening, and thanks to Veterans for Peace, and thanks to Code Pink, and thanks to Catholic workers, and groups like that, we are changing public opinion from a year ago, 83% saying they were in favor, to about 60% today. And that's a huge drop after a one year period. So it is changing, but it's not thanks to people in Washington or people who normally would be part of a movement for human rights and justice. Boston might change that. And Boston might turn it back around, yeah, temporarily. Yeah. People are so crazy that yeah. Who did you say was the main um, <coughs> manufacturing export of drugs? Israel. Mm -hmm. Think there's any connection? Well, there's been a, con a connection for decades between the United States and <coughs> Israel on the uh, all kinds of military technology, and particularly on these drones, because the Predator and Reaper drone was designed by an engineer who worked for the Israeli Defense Forces. And they are sharing this technology, and the Israelis are selling it, uh, using as a selling point that they are constantly testing it out of the battlefield, and the battlefield is the Gaza Strip. Yeah. And we give them $30 million a day. A year, uh, we give them thirty million dollars a year. We give them three billion dollars a year. Uh, President Obama has has called for an increase in the money going. To That's what we know about war again. Okay. Thank you. <coughs> <coughs> um, I'm a retired journalist, and I still follow a lot of the search. Sometime on the, since the first of the year, one of the things that passed on my screen was a report of 244 locations, map locations in the United States where there are drones. Three of those were in New Mexico. Uh, one was in Clovis, which makes sense as an Air Force base in Clovis. Second one was in Albuquerque, an Air Force base in Albuquerque. And the third one was a surprise to me, it was Santa Fe. I haven't, and it was the Shadowhawk uh, model of, of drones. I haven't been able to pursue it. Is it the Forest Service? Is it the County government, please, I don't know, but there is something happening here with drones in place. There is a group called Muckrock that is doing a Freedom of Information Act request for people that want to find out more, and they, so they, they say they make it quite easy for you, so if anybody wants to use it, it's just muck, M -E -C -K -R -C -K dot org. Well, first of all, thank you for being here. Um, I have a recommendation and a question. Um, I decided, we had a presentation a month or two ago on drones, and I decided the one thing I could do was forward articles that I had seen to our congressman's office, Congressman Henry Ruan. Um, I didn't hear anything, I didn't hear anything. Ran into him in the market, and he says, I've read every correspondence you sent me. Wow. And he said, I will send you a letter explaining my position, which was for accountability, for openness, for um, investigations on civilian casualties, et cetera, et cetera. So my recommendation is that if each of us just pick one of our federal legislators to do that with, it's important <coughs> they could respond. The unfortunate thing is, I don't think he's in the right place in the food chain to do a lot about it. So, what's your suggestion in terms of who we should focus on? Because our senators and our congressmen are not on the defense committees. Well, I think your senators have a lot of power, and your senators um, could have voted against John Brennan being confirmed as the CIA director, so they might say nice things, but when it comes down to it, um, they went ahead and voted for somebody who was involved in torture under the Bush administration and was the mastermind of the drone program. So I think it's important to go back to them and say, uh, your senators are Udall and Hyde, both Denver. 
No, they both voted for Brennan. Yeah. Yes. There were only two Democrats who voted against Brennan. And one was uh, Merkley in Oregon, and the other was Lady. So they voted for a murder, <laughs> a torture. Um, I think that's an opening to go back to go to them and say, uh, we are upset that you voted to confirm John Brennan, that this is like giving a stamp of approval to this policy, and what are you going to do about it now? Now, it's very interesting what's happening because the Obama administration is becoming <coughs> ashamed of its own policy. This is now being talked about in the media, being talked about by Rand Paul in the Congress, protests happening all over the place. Internationally, the UN is undertaking a study worried that there have been war crimes committed, they said, by the United States, and uh, taking 25 examples of drone strikes and looking into them. It's supposed to come out with a report in October. And this has become uh, very difficult for the administration to keep up. So now they're saying, maybe we should move the drones out of the hands of the CIA into the military. This is something that we have been pushing for because we say the CIA is totally unaccountable. But we also don't want it to be the solution that now they're in the hands of the military and the military can just go doing extrajudicial killings. But um, that might be something that you talk to the, the your senators about. Um, can they find out for you what is happening in terms of the transferring of drones away from the hands of the CIA? What is happening in terms of uh, making uh, signature strikes illegal, meaning killing people just on the basis of suspicious activities? What is being done to make it illegal to do secondary strikes? Those are steps we can take along the way. And I think asking whether it's uh, Lujan or whether it's your senators, kind of specific things like that, um, would be a way to go. And they can, even though they're not on the, uh, they're not on the Defense Committee, they're not on the Armed Services, I mean, they're not on the Intelligence Committees, and they're not on the Judiciary? They're on Appropriations. Well, well there you go. Appropriations. appropriations. Perfect. So, um, there's, I, 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 I think it's important to go back to the Senators, and I think it's important to ask your Congressperson, okay, you have a good position, but what are you going to do? Yes, uh, what is being done to keep the drone technology out of the hands of those who would not wish the U.S. or their allies uh, well? Well, one country that you might, uh, I don't know that you would, but the uh, U.S. government might put in that category is Iran. Uh, what has the U.S. done in the case of Iran? Sent our most sophisticated spy plane over their country, and the Iranians say they hacked it. It came down, perfect condition. They showed it to the world and said, thank you very much, President Obama, for this beautiful gift that you have given us. They reversed engineered it, and they are making their own. Um, they are also making armed drones, uh, and they are giving armed drones to Hezbollah. They are giving armed drones to... Uh, uh, um, who knows who else they're giving them to. There was a drone that was just downed, shot down by the Israelis last, uh, a couple of days ago. And they said it was an Iranian drone. So, you know, we are starting to fill the airspace with all of these weapons. And uh, if you have an air force like Israel does, you just shoot them down. Um, there's now a, a special uh, laser that the, has been invented by our wonderful companies that can burn up a drone in the air by just shooting this high-powered laser up there. And uh, the companies just laugh all the way to the bank because, you know, it's really what they want. So what are we doing? We're not doing much. Now, I, I should say, U.S. companies are still restricted about who they can sell their drones to. And they're very upset about that and they're pushing for it to be opened up more. They're saying, you're restricting us, but meanwhile, the Israelis will sell, the Chinese will sell, you know, that old argument. Um, the South Africans just made a deal to send, uh, sell armed drones to the uh, Saudis. Um, so no matter what kind of restrictions we have, the genie's out of the bottle. Can you tell the audience about your own drone? Oh, so we have a drone. <laughs> um, Anybody see those little parrot drones? You can buy them on Amazon.com, you can buy them at Brookstone. So uh, when I was writing the book, somebody sent me a drone. 
And I said, well, that's, that's kind of cute. It, it really is. They're kind of cool, I must say. Uh, you, can, you can program them. You can uh, manipulate them through your smartphone. So you just download an app, and then you put the drone on the ground, and then you're sending it up in the air, and it is, you're, you're seeing the pictures on your, on your phone of everything that the drone is seeing up in the air. So um, we are taking our drone and, and we took it uh, to the home of the CEO of General Atomics, who makes the drones. And um, <laughs> we had a great protest going there and the police were there. And, uh, the police said, you cannot fly that drone over his house. And uh, meanwhile, we had a young kid with his phone over here who just said, Maybe we can, not let's see, you know, and start the drone goes up in the air. And then the police are all like going crazy and they find it. the kid there and they said that, you know, they're going to arrest him, they're going to find him, that he doesn't have a permit to use the drone. And then he says, and we're all saying, but you know, come on, it's all right. And he said, it might hurt somebody. And that was the funniest line of the whole protest, this little parrot drone might hurt somebody. But now we really like this, so we're going to take our drone and we're going to fly it over the home of John Brennan, the, the head of the CIA. We know where he lives. We took to his home several times. Two o'clock in the morning. Two o'clock in the morning, good idea. And uh, we're going to take it to the home of a couple other people, see how they like being buzzed. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it was really, um, uh, I went to visit Julian Assange last week in London, and he has been given political asylum by the Ecuadorian embassy. He faces charges of uh, sexual misconduct in Sweden. He has, his lawyers have asked for the authorities in Sweden to come to interrogate him in uh, in London, they have refused to do so. They want to extradite him to Sweden. He says this is trumped up charges because once I get to Sweden, they will extradite me to the United States where I will be facing the charges that Bradley Manning is facing, which is a lifetime in prison. So he's been there for almost two years already. I mean, this is crazy. He lives in a little tiny room in the embassy. And... Um, he doesn't know how this is going to play itself out. There are several scenarios that are being discussed, but nothing so far has worked itself out. Um, he is in a much better position than Bradley Manning. Uh, he is at least free to be on the phone, to do interviews, to do work, which he does an amazing amount of work. Uh, he has volunteers who are in the embassy who work with him. And he's, um, for his situation, uh, amazingly upbeat. He really thinks that um, the it, he, he really thinks it is absolutely critical that people find, get, and put out to the public information that the public needs to know about what their government is doing. And I talked about the drone stuff, and he says, you know, he hopes people on the inside will get this information out. Because we talked about an example that the Obama administration hasn't even given the legal memos that justify the drone strike to the oversight committees in Congress who are supposed to be doing their job, much less to the public. He said those memos need to be made public. And there's all kinds of memos about the drone activity that needs to be made public. So he is defiant. He is uh, upbeat. Um, he really wants people to do something about Bradley Manning. He said, I said, what can people do? So he named three things. And I published an interview with him that you can find if you Google my name and Julian Assange. So the three things he said is contact your media and ask them to write about, uh, and just to explain the Bradley Manning situation quickly, Bradley Manning has uh, <coughs> pled guilty to 10 charges 
that could lead to 20 years in prison. But the administration is not satisfied with that. They want to add on to the charges, charges of espionage, charges of communicating with the enemy, aiding and abetting the enemy, which could lead to life in prison. So Julian Assange says it's so important for the media because this is about freedom of, of, of the press. And the media has to come out and say, if I publish something that has been leaked to me, that does not make me uh, somebody who has communicated with the enemy. Uh, and so they want the media, to, and he wants op-eds to come out. And he gave an example of a good op-ed that the LA Times wrote that said, it is ridiculous to charge Bradley Manning with espionage. Um, and then he said that we should contact two organizations, Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch. And he said it's been pathetic that they have refused to call Bradley Manning a prisoner of conscience. <laughs> And I was, in, I was in a meeting in Amnesty the day after I met with Julian Assange. And I said, is it really true that you won't call Bradley Manning a, a prisoner of conscience? Because Julian Assange says, you know, he is the prisoner of conscience. He, you know, in the United States, he is like the number one prisoner of conscience right now. And Amnesty says, we are going to wait till after the trial. Because we want to see what comes out in the trial. <laughs> so that is really terrible. So I think contacting Amnesty and saying, come on, you know, name him a prisoner of conscience, do your job, and do the same thing for Human Rights Watch. And the last thing he said is get as many people as we can to Fort Meade for the trial, um, which will start on June 2nd. Where is it? Fort Meade, Maryland. A little far from here, but hey, you should come. I'd like to make one more quick to the gentleman who has a writing relationship with Ben Ray Lujan, and that is to write back to him and say that we are much more interested in humanity and morality than we are in transparency and those other things. And I also think there are more than 60 people in here. If we all write to Ben Ray Lujan and tell him the same thing, it's true to get his attention. Fabulous. And I think what you're saying is really important because if they are, while we're calling for transparency and accountability, um, we do want more than that because they can be transparent about how they are uh, violating uh, the, the basic human rights of thousands of people. Um, but what we want them to do is to stop it. So I think um, as we do close, I want to say that I will be signing books over there for anybody who wants them and happy to talk to you more about this. And people who are our coping representatives here, could you stand up? So anybody who Maybe about the fast that we talked about for the Guantanamo prisoners. Any other ideas like the no drone resolutions? Anyway, I'd love to talk more. Thank you. I'd like to thank my great friend, Ms. Nia, for being here. I'd like to thank all of you for coming. Petitions out on the table as you read. If you didn't have a chance to sign in, very simple petition asking the president and the Congress to put an end to these illegal targeting killings. There's also a fair amount of material on the Veterans for Peace tables. Uh, it's all free. Contributions, of course, are welcome, but uh, please feel free to take anything that's there. So thanks again for coming. We'll see you at our next event.